This week for Come Follow Me, we are going to look at the fourth book of Moses. I'll put this up on the screen here so you can see what we're talking about. Now, the fourth book of Moses is Numbers. This is an account of the journeys of the uh, Israelites in the wilderness, and then they count everybody. It's a census, so thus they call it the book of Numbers. Now, Come Follow Me only has chapters 11 through 14 and 20 through 24, but uh, there's a few other things in there that I'll show you today. Now, let me show you a few uh, things that might be helpful uh, for teachers and for personal understanding and kind of as a family as well. If you go to the Gospel Library app or online, Map, Bible map number two is Israel's exodus from Egypt and entry into Canaan. This will be helpful for the book of Numbers. As you can see, and the book of Joshua and so forth. So you can see the, the, the exodus pattern here from Egypt, Mount Sinai. You'll notice that most of these locations are question marks. We really don't know where they were at. But we have a general idea of where they were at including uh, Kadesh Barnea, which is part of this week's story. They're supposed to go into the promised land, but they choose not to. So they return to the wilderness for 40 years. So everyone dies off except two wonderful individuals and then everyone under the age of 20. And then obviously going in. I also want you to notice the next Bible map will show that some of the tribes actually have land over here. So the promised land just isn't across the River Jordan. It's on both sides. So they all help conquer this land, and then even these tribes who remain over here help conquer this land. And we'll talk about some of those things over the next couple of weeks as we do that. So let's have a little uh, experience with this. Now, I often give teaching ideas for small families, you know, for with your little kids, sometimes for your classroom, seminary teachers, I hope, and institute teachers, I hope to be helpful in personal study. I'm hoping you can see the pattern of understand the story, and then after that, let's identify doctrines and principles, and make sure we understand why those doctrines and principles are important, testify of them and then make some form of personal application by liking the scripture to yourself. So this week, uh, this might not work for smaller children, but for older children, you definitely can do this one. Let me show you uh, just a simple chart. I mean, really, it should be as simple as this. Uh, there's the list of numbers, the book of uh, the chapters, right? 11, 12, 13, 14, 20, 21, 22, 23, and 24. The first part is content. Just read that chapter and ask yourself, what's the story? Now, for most, this is the most difficult part because you're dealing with a culture that's more than 3,000 years old. You're dealing with customs that are so unique and, and different. But I think really even young teenagers can read the story and gain at least some basic understanding of what's going on. With primary children, you help them understand Again, I attended primary yesterday. It was great. Again, most of the time is dealt with content. We need to move past the content, though, to say, well, what lesson can we learn from this? And then the one below that, what is the understanding, or what do you understand about this? Why is that principle or doctrine important? Why do you feel, those are great questions to ask, even small children. Why do you think the children of Israel rebelled against Moses? Is there ever a time that you don't want to do what mom and dad say? And see, then you're getting into understanding and feeling the truth and the importance of, as well as it naturally leads into application of what we should do. So just for humor's sake, you could draw this chart in your class. If you're teaching seminary this week and say, let's say you did 11 today and you're like, what am I going to do for the rest of these? I have more uh, chapters than I do days, more stories than I do time. Well, draw this chart on the board and then assign people. Say, Susie, you get chapter 12. Uh, Ian, you get chapter 13. Uh, Esmeralda, you get chapter 14. And then say, read the, read the story by yourself. And then I'm going to have you come up to the board or I'll come up to the class and do a brief summary. What is the story and what lessons can we learn from it? In other words, what doctrines and principles? 
Now, they might find different doctrines and principles than you do, which is great. If there's an important one that you feel that they didn't share that you think should be mentioned, that's why the, the role of a teacher, it's why you're called and set apart. Uh, a mom and dad, you know, as a family, we need to discuss this doctrine or principle. But even for personal or family scripture study, family scripture study, you could assign a chapter a day or a chapter a, a family member or two chapters or three chapters and say, we want you to study on your own and then come back as a family and tell us what was the story, what's the doctrine or principle, and then let's talk about it. Why is it important? How can we live that story? So here is some start. For example, Numbers chapter 11. If we were to summarize Numbers chapter 11 briefly, is <laughs> the Lord sent fire to consume the complaining Israelites because they complained. So let's just dive into chapter 11 here for a moment. Numbers chapter 11. Open up your scriptures and join me for a little scripture study. Verse 1, when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. Okay, there's a principle right there. My complaining displeases the Lord. So we can understand and add the importance of that. Do, do we complain? How do you feel when you're sitting there next to a complainer? What do you think the Lord feels like when all we do is complain? Or, and then I can evaluate. Are my prayers complaining prayers? Pleading prayers? Or prayers of gratitude? I mean, there's, there's a lot of things in there. Verse 2. And the people cried unto Moses. And when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. Uh, I didn't read all of verse 1, which would be helpful, I guess, right? Notice in verse 1, the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. Now, you can take this two ways. And I don't know which way to take it is actual. Is it a literal event or is it a spiritual event? Now, literally, I get baptized with water, but spiritually, I get baptized with fire. That's not literal, right? So fire went through the camp and consumed them. Literally, maybe, I don't know. Spiritually, possibly, again, I don't know. But I can take it metaphorically, at least for me, and say, the fire of the Lord is going to come burn me. What is what is it going to happen? Is it going to consume me and destroy me because of my evil intent and heart? Or is it going to purify me? Because fire can do both things, right? So I'm putting up here as the principle, the Lord's fire can consume or purify me. My actions determine which one it does. Maybe the prophet said something at general conference. Or maybe our bishop or Relief Society president say something to us on Sunday, and it just burns. Is it going to purify us and make us more holy, more pure? Or is it going to consume us and destroy us? We really make the, our actions kind of determine that, right? So what's my application? I'm going to let the Lord purify me by, maybe there's something real personal there. Again, uh, our ch local church leader said something, or the prophet at or someone at General Conference did. Uh, we'll do a few more here in, in Numbers chapter 11. They're hungry. Well, they're really not hungry. They're just not grateful for the manna anymore. Remember, the word manna is, means in Hebrew, what is it? The Lord didn't call it manna. The Lord called it bread. I will give you bread, and the manna came. But they're like, what is this? Now they're complaining about it. Verse 5, notice where their memory takes them. Back to Egypt, and you'll see this multiple times this week in the reading. We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. Remember, slaves get fed. We're so happy to be slaves. We eat well. Now we're out here, and all we've had is bread and water. Notice the symbolism, and they miss it. So verse 6, now there is nothing at all besides this manna. They see they don't remember the gratitude of the Lord feeding them. So, verse 10, Then Moses heard the people weep throughout their families. At the very end, Moses was also displeased. So what does Moses do in verse 11? Wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant? He's pleading to the Lord himself. In verse 14, I am not able to bear all this people alone because it is too heavy for me. I wonder if our prophet ever feels just so overwhelmed that, you know, I'm doing everything that I'm supposed to do, but the people just aren't doing it. 
they're not reading. They're not going to the temple. They're not paying their tithing. They're not keeping the word of wisdom, dot, dot, dot. I wonder if he has those feelings. So verse 16, the Lord reminds Moses, why don't you go gather 70 men? Again, there's another principle right there, right? If we need help, go get people to help us. Uh, delegation is really important. Well, let's go to verse 18. Let's go back to our uh, our thing. I love verse 18. And say thou unto the people, this is the Lord talking to Moses, sanctify yourselves against tomorrow, and ye shall eat flesh. For ye have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, Who shall give us flesh to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt, therefore the Lord will give you flesh. How much? Notice verse 20. Until it come out of your nostrils and it be loathsome to you. The Lord is going to teach these people a lesson. You are so ungrateful for what I've given you. I'm going to give you what you want, which I think is another principle. God will give us what we want, even if it's contrary to what's best for us. Sometimes just to teach us a lesson. So he gives them. Oh, let's go down. Well, there's another story right in the middle of this story that makes it kind of fun. There's the whole gathering of the 70, and they start prophesying. In fact, verse 25, The Lord came down in a cloud and spake unto him, and took of the Spirit that was upon him, and gave it to the 70 elders. And it came to pass that when the Spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. So, can people prophesy besides the prophet? Well, absolutely, right? Whoever we have jurisdiction for, a bishop can prophesy for his ward. A Relief Society president can prophesy for her, for her wonderful society. Parents can prophesy for their family. So in verse 26, two of the men were still prophesying. Eldad and Medad, right? They prophesied to the camp. So in verse 27, someone's not happy with it. It's a young man. Verse 27, there ran a young man and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad do prophesy in the camp. Okay, so what do we do? Moses' reply is wonderful in verse 29. And Moses said unto him, Envious thou for my sake? Would God that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. Wouldn't it be great if every member of the church received a revelation for themselves of what to do. Think of the burden that would take off of our church leaders as we are receiving individual revelation. Again, you got, you got the story, right? What's the doctrine? Individuals can receive revelation for themselves. The power of that is we can receive direction on what we should be doing. Application, maybe I should start praying for my personal revelation. So verse 31, we go back to the story of the we're tired of manna. Verse 31, there were, and there were, went forth a wind from the Lord and brought quells from the sea. So there's all these quells. What do they do? They eat them. While they're eating them, verse 33 answers this, while the flesh, or the quell meat, was yet between their teeth. They're still chewing the meat. The wrath of the Lord was kindled against the people, and the Lord smote the people with a very great plague. And called the name of the place, there's your pronunciation, you can read that, because there they buried the people that lusted. Again, lusting, desiring something that they shouldn't have. They should have been grateful for what they have. The consequences of plague. You can think about that today. What's the plagues we have today? Plagues of lust. In this case, it's lust of food. There's immorality. There's word of wisdom. There's things that we lust after or we desire that the Lord says, just be grateful for what I've given you, and you will avoid all of that. That's Numbers chapter 11. There's some great stories in there. So if I were to put up all of the books, maybe here is a very brief uh, summary or thing of each of the chapters. Israel murmurs, lust for meat. Seventy are chosen. Everyone be a prophet. See how easy that was? We just went through a chapter. Uh, a teenager could read that and find some of the stories in there. And which story they find, uh, it, to me, it doesn't matter. As long as they can read, find a story, identify, and then explain a doctrine or a principle. In other words, the stories in the scriptures for a reason. What does the Lord want us to learn from it? Why is that important and what personal application can I get?
repeat that process through all of the chapters and you'll be okay. I, I think families can do that. Uh, children with help and guidance, they should be capable of doing this. Read the story and then ask, why do you think this story is in the scriptures? What lesson can we learn from it? That's an easy way to say, what's the doctrine or principle identified in this story? And there can be many. So practice doing that. Uh, for you seminary teachers, you've been with your students all semester long. Uh, your students should be good at this now. And again, you they need a teacher to guide them and help them and keep them on path and to help organize them. But organize this up and uh, get going and have some fun study. I'll give a little more commentary and content information for some of these chapters if you so desire them and have a little f fun with that. In fact, I mean, a fun family activity. You could ask the kids what's their favorite candy and then give them so much of that candy that it makes them sick. Uh, Halloween, right? Eat as much as you can. So is there too much of something? Should we be grateful for what we have? I mean, there are some fun things you can do. Be a little creative. So let's go through a couple more of these chapters. Chapter 12, Aaron and Miriam. Now remember, this is Moses' older brother and older sister, and they complain. But notice in verse 1, Miriam's name is mentioned first. That's, I think, because she's probably the instigator in this. And thus, she gets the consequence. Remember, it says in there that they spoke out against because Moses, when he was in Egypt, married an Ethiopian woman. Uh, again, the custom of the day for that was when you conquered a land, you would marry um, someone of that land to build relationships and tie countries together. Moses was a prince of Egypt. He probably, I mean, that's a possibility why he married an Ethiopian woman. But that's not really the story, nor is that really the problem. Miriam and Aaron are complaining that their younger brother is telling them what to do. And, and they complain. So what's the consequence? Well, Miriam, in verse 10, becomes leprous. She receives leprosy. Uh, now, here's what may have happened. This is not politically correct. But because she doesn't hold the priesthood and she's combating her priesthood leader... God gives her a curse, and the only way out of leprosy, remember, you're, you're kicked out of camp, and you have to be considered clean. And how do you get considered clean? You have to go to your local priesthood leader, and he has to declare you clean. So God's teaching Miriam a very, very important lesson about following priesthood leaders. Uh, not politically correct today, but, boy, there's a powerful lesson in that. Let's go to chapter 13. This is where we come to the map portion, right? Uh, each of the 12 tribes of Israel were supposed to pick one captain, right? And they were supposed to go into the wilderness here. And they're somewhere up here in Kadesh Barnea. That's what the scriptures say. And they're supposed to send one spy from each tribe into the promised land. And make a report to prepare. Because remember, this is their promised land. They're supposed to go in there. Now, again, many people have had a lot of difficulty saying, why would God command the Israelites to go destroy this nation? I just want to remind you that way back in Genesis chapter 15, and I'll read it here for you. Genesis chapter 15, verse 16. The Lord was going to destroy the people then. This is back in Abraham's day. Because remember, Abraham was given this land. It's his land for his people. But Genesis 15, 16 says, But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. God doesn't destroy these people for four generations. Hundreds of years have passed. He's giving them a chance to repent, but what he knows is going to happen is they become more wicked, more wicked, and more wicked. And over time, uh, they become so, it's just like the Noah's time, they become so wicked that their children don't even have a chance to grow up in a righteous household. So the spies go in and check out the land. And they, in chapter 13, it lists the spy of each land, and they're supposed to see the land and the people. That's verse 18. And then they come back, and they're supposed to give a report. What do they see? Verse 27. 
We came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of the land. If you recall, they brought back grapes and uh, figs and things from the land. Uh, again, the, the phrase floweth with milk and honey just means it's milk is a nurturing uh, beverage, right, to give nourishment. Honey is a sweetener. So it just symbolically means the land will both nurture us and give us abundance, sweetness. It'll be a delightful land. But 10 of the 12 spies give what they call an evil report. Verse 28. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw there the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites. So they're bringing up all of these. We can't do this. We can't go and conquer this land. They have completely forgotten that God delivered them from Israel, or from Egypt, part of the Red Sea, destroyed the Egyptian army, fed them water and bread, and took care of them in the wilderness. Miracle after miracle after miracle, and all they can say is, we can't do that. Those people are too big, too strong, too powerful. But Caleb and Joshua were different. Verse 30, Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go at once and possess it, for we are able to overcome it. Talk about faith and works. He's both faithful that God will help us, and he says, let us go and we'll, we'll do it. Verse 31, but the men that went with him said, we be not able to go against the people, for they are stronger than we. There's no faith. There's no uh, hope in Christ delivering them. So what is the result? Well, they don't go. In fact, when you read these chapters in here, the Lord will say only Caleb and only Joshua will get to go to the promised land. Now, we know Moses will be translated, but everyone else who's over the age of 20, they're going to go out back in the wilderness for 40 years, and they'll all end up dying, whether of age, disease, or other things, that only the children and the next generation will be able to go into the promised land. Well, they don't want to hear that. So what do they say? Well, in, verse, in chapter 14, they want to go back to Egypt. Let's go back to Egypt. Could you even imagine? Uh, but the Lord obviously is going to tell them, no, we're not going back to Egypt. So what are they going to do then? Let's go to chapter... Uh, 15 is not part of our reading. Should we skip over the next one? Well, he tells them in verse 37. This is chapter 14, verse 37. All of the people, those 10 men who brought back the evil report that with no faith, they ended up dying and so forth. Uh, so they're all going to go. So again, what's the story? What's the or what's the principle in here? Well, be, be faithful. Go forward with faith. What's the consequence? Well, some of them say, we are now going to go back to battle. And without the Lord's blessing, they go try to conquer the land of Canaan, uh, the land of promise, right? And what happens? They get annihilated. God says, no, I changed the commandment. God changes commandments based upon our actions. I'll give some examples. The commandment we heard at the conference in April of 2022, reiterated. Young men, go serve a mission. Women, you are able to, and if you're willing, we would love to have you serve as well. But the men, there's a res priesthood responsibility to go serve a full-time mission, if at all possibility. There might be a man who says, you know, I don't want to go, and might live a lifestyle contrary to that which will allow him to go. And then he might say, well, I want to go on a mission now, and the Lord will say, nope, I've changed your commandment. Your commandment's not to go. You still be a missionary, do missionary work, but you can't serve a full-time proselyting mission. I, I've seen and talked with some people who their Lord has changed that commandment. And they get frustrated. Well, I want to go back and do this, and sometimes you just can't. Sometimes you can't go back and change actions that have disqualified you from uh, 
certain callings, certain things. Um, hard, but true. Now, does the Lord, will the Lord forgive and can we be clean and pure? Oh, absolutely. I do believe that. Let's move forward now to chapter 20. So we're in Numbers chapter 20. In this story here, Miriam, uh, Moses' older sister, actually ends up uh, dying. She dies. And the children of Israel are thirsty again. So what do they want? So let's go to Numbers chapter 20, verse 8. Take, this is the Lord speaking to Moses, Take the rod and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock. And speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock, so that thou so thou shalt give the uh, congregation and their beasts to drink. Remember, they're thirsty. How do you want this? And they want water. Verse 10, And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels. We Must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice, and the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank and their beasts also. Again, God takes care of us. There's a principle in that. Now, I saw a couple pictures uh, recently uh, about this scene. A colleague of mine showed some pictures. One was this great picture, and it shows this little squirt of water coming out, almost like a drinking fountain. Some, that's an artist's description of water coming out of that. But if you look at verse 11, how much of water came out? It says abundantly. And he showed another picture of a river pouring out of this rock and filling up the desert. I believe that God is a God of abundance. He will give us more than we need. Think about it. Jesus fed the 5,000 and there were leftovers. That's just how he does. If our lives, if we feel like we're thirsty or hungry and we need and we go to the Lord, he will give us our needs. He will give us not only milk to nurture us, he'll give us honey that will be sweet to us. We just have to be grateful for what he gives us. I love that. Now, let's go down to verse 14, chapter 20, verse 14. Uh, Moses sent messengers from Kadesh unto the king of Edom, thus saith thy brother Israel, Now, I just, this is, let me put the map up here. This will help us a little bit. Just a reminder that the children of Israel are distant cousins with some of these people. Remember, if you're from Edom, you're an Edomite. Remember, Edom's Esau. That's Jacob's brother. So Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob's brother Esau, who sold the birthright, becomes the children of Edom. So there is a blood relationship with these people. So he's simply recognizing that blood relationship uh, when he's talking in here. Uh, Let's keep going here. He's asking, please let us pass through your land, which he doesn't, and then we know the consequence when you go against the commandments of the Lord. Verse 21, Edom refused to give Israel passage. So, again, there's some fun stories in here. Verse 26 is interesting. Verse 25, we'll start with. Take Aaron and Eleazar, his son, and bring them up to the Mount Hor, and strip Aaron of his garments, and put them upon Eleazar, his son. And Aaron shall be gathered unto his people, and shall die there. Now, this is all symbolic. They're taking off the priestly robe, the robe of the high priest, off of Aaron, not because of dishonor in this case, but because he's old and he's about to die, they put them upon Eleazar, who will become the new high priest. We see transition between leaders often. Maybe you've seen that uh, in, in your ward. Bishops, the Relief Society presidents, young women's leaders, young men's leaders. Uh, sometimes we ask them to share their testimony. We usually give them a sustaining vote of just gratitude. We're thankful for your service. We just want to recognize that. And we put the new 
article of clothing or the mantle, right? And we'll get to that story later, but the, the clothing uh, onto the next person. And you can have a discussion about transferring power. Well, I mean, when the prophet dies, how does that happen? Uh, when the high priest goes, when the stake president, when the bishop goes. Sometimes kids have been around a bishop for five or six years. They really don't remember a previous bishop. Uh, it's a good time to talk about that transition. Uh, chapter 21 now. Let's continue on here and do a little bit more here. Chapter 21. Uh, lots of stories in here, but I want to specifically go to the one that's probably the most famous here is the, uh, uh, there's the destruction there. In, in verse 3, when they destroy all the cities, again, I've already shown you clearly from Genesis that they were destroyed. I, I also think you should go to 1 Nephi chapter 17. Uh, in chapter 3, verse uh, excuse me, chapter 21, Numbers 21, verse 3, the footnote in destroyed, in A, the little A there, there's the there's a cross-reference to 1 Nephi 17. There's some great verses in there that clearly explain that these people that they're destroying are evil. And so that might be helpful for those concerned about the lives of other people. Let's do verse 6. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came unto Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord. Now, notice, in this case, they have recognized that they, they're sinners. They, they've recognized their mistakes. And they go to Moses and says, Please, Moses, pray. Take away the fiery serpents. So he goes to the Lord to pray, and instead of taking the fiery serpents away, the Lord commands Moses in verse 8, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass. And everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. Now, we are familiar with this story, I hope, because it's all over the place. It's referenced in John chapter 3, 2 Nephi chapter 5, and Alma 33. I would do cross-references with the class. Uh, I would pull up a picture of that symbol, and then you can Google this. Pull up a, a, a symbol of, of current medical society, right? Doctors, medical, on all the ambulances. What's the symbol of medicine? It's the brass pole with the serpent on it. Google it. Pull it up. Have the kids, little kids, they can color it and say, hey, what do you need to do now to look and live? And there's even some old, old church movies about that that are kind of funny. So, again, maybe have them make it. If your students really love to be creative and artsy or crafty, uh, have them draw, paint, uh, make a symbol. Uh, notice, in this case, the serpent the serpent is a symbol of Christ. you got to be careful because some people think, oh, the Satan's always the serpent. Not in this case. It's, it's a symbol of the servant, uh, of the Savior. Let's do the last three chapters, 22, 23, and 24. This is an interesting, really almost a fascinating story, uh, but it's not my favorite story. So I won't spend a lot of time on it. But Balak is a king, and he knows he's about to get whooped by these Israelites because he's seen it. I mean, these people know that the Israelites have been conquering as they're going. And he knows that his false gods aren't good enough. So somehow he finds a guy named Balaam who... We don't know if he's an actual righteous priesthood holder. He could be a descendant from, from Abraham's family, Sarah's family, right? Uh, but nonetheless, he goes to this Balaam who believes in the God, and Balak wants him to have the God of Israel curse the children of Israel. My gods can't stop him, so let's get your God to stop you. Uh, it's almost humorous that he would do that. And he offers him money. He sends princes and royalty and does everything he can. And Balak's on his way to go do it. And then you know the story, right? There's an angel that stops in front of his donkey, and the donkey won't go. So he keeps kicking the donkey, right? You've you heard the story, and the donkey turns around and talks to him. And in the story, it makes it sound like that's a normal conversation. So somewhere there's it's just a fascinating story that, Balaam is either used to talking animals or is so 
outside of where he's supposed to be that he doesn't even recognize that that's wrong <laughs> or it just gets missed in the storytelling. But that's where he's at. But there is something in this story that we we miss right here. By the way, that's all chapter 22. 23, Balaam actually prophesies. It talks about the coming of the Savior and so forth uh, in, in verse 20, or chapter 24. That's all in there. But there is something in here that's not in this week's reading, but I do want to point out here. It's in chapter 25. So go to Numbers chapter 25. And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredoms with the daughters of Moab. So the Israelites go to Moab. Again, if I pull the map up here and let you see this. So they've conquered Edom. They're in Moab now. And the children of Israel, instead of conquering the land, they're now committing whoredoms. Well, what happened was, and it doesn't say that right here. It does tell us in Numbers 31, which is even later, right? Numbers 31 says, Behold, the children, excuse me, these caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor. And there was a plague among the children of the congregation. So what happens is Balaam doesn't accept the money to curse the children of Israel because of the whole situation there with the donkey and seeing the angel and the Lord telling him not to. But what he does is he tells him, you know what? The only way to defeat Israel is they have to be wicked. If they were to commit adultery and riotous lifestyles, they'd lose the blessing of the God of Israel. So if you can get them to do that. So here's the king of Moab saying, well, that's easy. So he gets all of the daughters of Moab, sends them out there to have uh, affairs with the children of Israel. They start doing that. They lose the power of the Lord. Again, valuable principle in here is if you keep the commandments, the Lord's on your side. He will lead you to victory. You go forward with faith, you win. You don't, you lose that power. I think there's a powerful principle just within that. And I hope that's, I think that's a helpful story um, and some good stuff for that. Okay, I'm going to close with telling you what's coming up in the future here. So if we put this up, uh, we finished Numbers this week, this week's Numbers, next week's Deuteronomy. Now, again, if you check your Come Follow Me, it'll just give you specific chapters. Uh, but I'll just talk a little bit about where we get the book of Deuteronomy from and, and give you a little bit with that. So next week's Deuteronomy, and then the week after that, the children of Israel will actually enter the Promised Land. We'll cross the River Jordan anyway, and we'll discuss the book of Joshua. So I hope you get a few... Uh, ideas, uh, a little bit of context, content, but most importantly, ask yourself the question, what lesson does the Lord want us to learn from these stories? Why are these lessons important? And how can I live them in my life? Again, for small children, have them do some artwork or some crafts, make a serpent and say, what can I do to look to the Lord? Uh, older kids, have them, you, have them identify what these principles are and have a great week uh, learning and studying. Come follow me.